I love him. I loved him with all my heart. What the op-ed was about was, um, you know, me loaning my voice to a bigger cultural conversation that we were having at the time. What's going on, everyone? Welcome to the Behavioral Arts. And this week, we are looking at Amber Heard's interviews on NBC News, talking about the trial, talking about the verdict. I'm gonna analyze her body language. We're gonna talk about her word choice and we're gonna see what they might reveal about how she really feels about this whole thing. Now, just to clarify for those who are a little confused, she only did one interview with NBC, and that full interview airs today on Dateline. But throughout the week, they were posting little snippets on the Today Show as a preview. So in this video, we're only looking at the clips that were on the Today Show, but this Sunday at 2 p.m. Eastern, I'm doing a live stream with some amazing guests, all of which really understand behavior analysis, and we're gonna break down other scenes from the whole thing and you're all invited to come hang out. We're going to do a Q&A. We're going to analyze more clips and that is all going down this Sunday, the 19th at 2 p.m. Eastern. I hope to see you there. But right now, let's jump right into these clips from the Today Show. For some people, they just were frankly disgusted by the whole thing and don't have much sympathy for either one of you. Can you understand that? Absolutely. I would not blame the average person for looking at this and how it's been covered and not think that it is Hollywood brats at their, at their worst. I'd, but what people don't understand is it's, it's actually so much bigger than that. Okay, so I wanted to start with a clip that really highlights Savannah Guthrie's skills as an interviewer. And we're gonna see a lot of stuff going on with her throughout this interview, but right there in the beginning, she asks that question in a very interesting way. She says, a lot of people look at this scenario and really don't sympathize with either side. Now, this is a technique that we're actually taught in interrogation, like for criminal interrogation. And what she's doing there is she's sort of empathizing quite a bit more with Amber than most other people because I don't think that what she said there reflects the vast majority of what we're seeing online. The vast majority of people do sympathize with Johnny Depp and not with Amber Heard. But if she says that, she puts Amber on the defense. She's actually delaying that by asking this the way she did. By saying, you know, a lot of people don't sympathize with you or him, now Amber feels like she's playing on an equal playing ground. So great tactic there from Savannah Guthrie. Now let's look at Amber's body language. Throughout this video, I'm gonna focus a lot on her body language. There's gonna be a couple of heavy clusters of deception coming up a little later on. But as my regular viewers know, I like to remain very objective in my analysis because research has shown that if we get subjective or emotional, it compromises the effectiveness. And that's very challenging with a case like this, I must admit, because there's a lot of emotion. But if we just completely wipe the slate clean and look at her as, you know, here's Amber Heard talking on this interview, right here with her body language, there isn't much going on. We're not seeing that over dramatic sort of gestures that she tends to do. She's answering the question, and so far I think body language wise, it's going pretty well. But with her words, there's a couple of things happening that are very noteworthy. First of all, she's doing this give and take technique that she's gonna do a lot throughout this interview. And this is where she kind of for a moment agrees with her critics, and then she says something to take that back. So here she's saying how, you know, people might look at this and think that this is just, you know, Hollywood brats at their worst. And so it kind of seems like, okay, I get it. But then she goes, but here's what people have to understand. It's so much more than that. So if you really break down what she's saying to the bare minimum, to the simplest form, it's, oh, I totally get what everyone's saying, but they don't get what's really happening. So I get it, but they don't get it. I'm giving, but I'm taking. We also get a classic Amber Heard slip up. Now on cross-examination, she did this a lot where she mistakenly slipped information out. And here, she's saying the opposite of what she thinks she's saying. Really listen to her words. I would not blame the average person for looking at this and not thinking these are Hollywood brats at their worst. That's a double negative. What she meant to say or what she meant to convey is that she wouldn't blame someone for thinking this is Hollywood brats at their worst. The way she said it means she would blame someone for thinking that these are Hollywood brats at their worst. And that double negative is a slip up. So what does this slip up mean? Does it simply mean that she lost track of her sentence and kind of misspoke? Or does it indicate that she doesn't truly believe that this is just Hollywood brats at their worst, but she's just saying that to kind of sympathize and connect with her audience that might think that. Well, 
There's no amount of research that's gonna give us that answer, that's gonna tell us which of those two things it is. In cases like this, you have to use your best judgment. For me, provided that immediately after that, she said, but this is actually so much more than that, to me indicates that that was just a tactic to try to be like, yeah, no, I totally, totally get that. I'm trying to connect with this, but that's completely wrong. Here's what's really happening. This is, uh, this is not only about our First Amendment right to speak. But here's the thing about the First Amendment. The First Amendment protects free speech. It doesn't protect lies that amount to defamation. And that was the issue in the case. Yes, exactly. You can't go into, the free speech does not protect you if you, you know, go into a crowded theater and you scream fire. We get the concept of free speech from the Greeks. My understanding of what that means is not just the freedom to speak. It's a freedom to speak truth to power. Okay, once again, let's start with Savannah Guthrie here because we're beginning to see just a little bit here of that confrontational vibe that we're gonna see a lot more of later in this interview. So Amber Heard brings up the First Amendment right and Savannah Guthrie immediately, we could see a slow blink. This is when we just blink, but slowly as she comes up to try to confront that. And usually when we, when we lose patience or when we're like trying to calm ourselves, slow blinks happen at sort of, Oh, okay, you didn't just go there, moment. It's not exaggerated, it's very subtle, but she does that as her hand comes up like this and she gestures with the pen. So notice how teachers or CEOs or figures of authority will often, if they have a pen in their hand, use it like this to gesture. We call these illustrators. Illustrators are gestures we make to emphasize what we're saying, but with that pen, it has a very disciplinary vibe. And in this case, she's correcting her. Notice how she doesn't ask a question. It's just a correction. The First Amendment right doesn't protect you from lies. And that's what was happening here. Not, do you, do you feel like that's what was happening here? That's what was happening here. That's a correction. Now notice where Amber goes with that subtle accusation. Put yourself in that position. You're on an interview and somebody says, the First Amendment does not protect you from lying. Wouldn't your immediate answer go, yeah, and I wasn't lying. That's not what's happening here. Instead, she completely deflects, refuses to deny Savannah saying, you know, it doesn't protect you from lies and goes into this monologue about, you know, this, this example of like, you, you know, if you're going to a theater and you yell fire, and then she gives us a little bit of a history lesson talking about how this, it came from the Greeks. And it's like, what, what's even happening here? Why is that the focus of this very important thing that Savannah Guthrie brought up, which is it doesn't protect you from lying. Like that people think that's what you're doing. Here's your opportunity to deny that. And I, I get a vibe from this very similar to when she was on the stand talking about the makeup kit. Remember when she went to this lecture and she was giving all these details and all these sort of way more information than needed. And I feel like this is something she does to sort of establish herself and say, oh, I, I know about the First Amendment. It came from the Greeks. You can't say it in the theater. She's establishing that she gets what the First Amendment is and she's trying to sort of in this confrontational moment, which I bet she felt, she's trying to gain the authoritative position in this conversation. There are two really important things that happen right there at the end as she says, freedom to speak, truth to power. The first is her hand comes up like this with her index finger sticking up as she says that. Now there's been a lot of really incredible research done on the hand gestures that we use when we speak. And it was conducted by best-selling authors, Alan and Barbara Pease, who wrote this book, The Definitive Book of Body Language. One of my favorites, I will leave a link in the description, but they found that finger up with all the rest of the fingers down like this, with just that index finger is one of the gestures that produces the least amount of likability. In other words, the listeners did not like someone who was talking like this. And this might be related to the way we evolved. This reminds us of like wielding a weapon and gesturing with that weapon like a club or a sword. And it's kind of sort of authoritative and a little bit aggressive even. Not only did the research indicate that it made the speaker less likable, but the listener actually retained less of what was happening. So here's a great tip for those of you who might sometimes talk like this. There's a very simple fix. If you bring the thumb up as well and do this, this completely changes it. This seems a lot less aggressive and a lot more informative than gesturing like this. Again, this is very disciplinary. Think about a teacher, even in cartoons, we see like someone like telling off someone. This gesture we equate to slightly aggressive and authoritative. Now, I really don't know if Amber is working with a good PR consultant, but if so, someone should really tell her to avoid speaking with that gesture because a lot of research shows that it just doesn't leave a good impression on your audience. 
Immediately after she says that, she does something that we're going to see more than once in this interview, where she sort of says that and she pauses and looks at Savannah Guthrie. And I know this look, I've seen this look, and it's Amber thinking she's made a good point. And she's like, she's like waiting for that acknowledgement. And she's going to do it several times throughout this interview. We're going to see it later again. But when she says that, it's freedom to speak, truth to power, pause. It's like, I'm, she's taking this authoritative sort of position and she's teaching something and she's really proud of herself for that moment. That pause is a, almost a self-acknowledgement. The DEP lawyer said, called your testimony the performance of a lifetime and said you were acting. What do you say to that? Says the lawyer for the man who convinced the world he had scissors for fingers. I'm the performer. I had listened to weeks of testimony uh, insinuating that, or saying quite directly that, you know, I'm a terrible actress. So I, I, I'm, a, I'm a bit confused how I could be both. This one's gonna be rather quick. Uh, first, this isn't behavior analysis or body language analysis, but I just have a pet peeve for bad metaphors. And she starts by saying that, Oh, I'm the actress, uh, yeah, and this is coming from the lawyer of a man who convinced the world he has scissors for fingers. And again, notice that sort of pause of like, I just made a good point. It's the same pause as earlier, a uh, bit of self-pride there, but let's break down that metaphor. It, it, it's not a really good one because Johnny Depp did not convince anyone in the world that he has scissors for fingers. There isn't a single person that if you went to and said, hey, in that movie, Edward Scissorhands, did you believe, were you convinced that he had, you know, Johnny Depp had scissorfingers? We'll go, no, it's a movie. I think she doesn't quite understand the difference between acting as part of a movie or acting in real life. And maybe that's part of the reason a lot of what she was doing on the stand seemed like an actor in a soap opera because she doesn't get how to separate those two things. In fact, I think a lot of people have a hard time separating those two things because every now and then I'll get a comment on my videos that say, how can you do analysis on an actor? They're acting. No, they're not. When they're on set, that's their job. The set, the atmosphere, the other actors, the time they take to get into character, to build that up, the director who's helping them get there, this all creates what they can do in that moment and act and dramatize. And sometimes they over-dramatize, but because we're watching this in the context of a fictional movie, we don't really notice it. But if they were to try to do that, out of that movie, out of that scene, and try to apply it to day-to-day -day life, it would look wrong, it would look weird. In fact, as Amber tried to do this on the stand, it was pretty noticeable. And I think one of the best examples of this is actually my career path. I built an entire career as a magician and a mentalist. I get on stage and I deceive for entertainment. But the goal of what I do is to use my gestures and my words to actually create deception, almost more than an actor. But off stage, I'm a terrible liar. I'm, you would know instantly with zero training because I get so uncomfortable when even I have to tell a little bit of a white lie. The way we behave, the way we move, this is all subconscious. It's not something we're controlling and actors don't get into character before every interaction that they have. So a lot of the time we are seeing their truth come out. Now, in the name of being objective, to be fair, I don't hate the second point that she made where she goes, well, which is it? Am I a good actress or am I a terrible one? Because people keep saying I'm a terrible actress, but you know, they're saying that I was up there on the stand acting the entire time. And that's, that's a decent strategy to kind of pick at this criticism that she was acting up there. But there is a fallacy in the way that she's thinking because Camille didn't say she's a good actress on the stand. She didn't say that she's a convincing one. She just said she's acting up there. So. Although I kind of like the fact that she's saying like, well, which is it? It doesn't really make sense as a contradiction to what Camille Vasquez said. Okay, now we're gonna jump into some really interesting body language moments and one of the biggest slip ups she's ever had that shows her true hand dramatically. But before we do, do me a big favor, hit that subscribe button, turn those notifications on for more behavior analysis. But you're testifying and you're just telling me today, I never started a physical fight and here you are on tape saying you did as I testified on the stand about this, is that when your life is at risk, not only will you take the blame for things that you shouldn't take the blame for, but when you're in an abusive dynamic, psychologically, emotionally, and physically, you don't have the resources that say you or I do with the luxury of saying, hey, this is black and white, because it's anything 
but when you're living in it. Okay, well that one's a whopper. Uh, first of all, let's really quickly talk about blink rate because I haven't yet. Throughout this interview, I want you to notice how inconsistent her blink rate is. There are stretches, she almost doesn't blink. She goes a really long time without blinking to where I'm looking at her going, and my eyes are burning. And don't have much sympathy for either one of you. Can you understand that? And then all of a sudden, it'll hit the roof. And it hits the roof in the interesting comments that I pointed out. Like when she said the Edward Scissorhands thing, flutter, flutter, and blink rate hit the roof. And this is no exception. So here she's asked about, you know, physically assaulting Johnny Depp. And we are getting, I would say, a cluster of deception. It's not a big one. She's had some really big ones. She's gonna, I'm gonna point out some big ones later. This is a, this is a decent sized one. First of all, she starts with what we call a referral statement, as I've said. And here's the thing. She said this a lot throughout this interview. A lot of sentences start with, as I've said, as I've testified, like I said. And referral statements have a lot of debate in behavior analysis. Some analysts consider it part of a deceptive cluster. Others will argue that all it indicates is a need for consistency. And I can totally see that, you know, sometimes someone's being honest, but they want to make sure that you understand that this has always been their position. So they might say something like, like I said, or like I told your, you know, your colleague or whatever the case is. So it's usually not a huge thing for me, but it's interesting that it's happening a lot here. Just at the least it indicates that Amber has a need here to convey that she's been consistent with this story. But then we have a refusal to deny. Savannah Guthrie is saying, you know, you're saying you hit him and she sidetracks and she dodges. She never flat out denies it. Uh, then we see a quick lip compression at some point. It's very fast and fleeting, but there's lip compression. Always remember tightness with the lips, whether we compress the lips or retract or bite the lips is usually withheld opinion. There's something we're not going to say or we don't like what we're saying and like we're, we're trying to take it back. It's trying to or actually withholding words. Once again, her blink rate is through the roof on this one and pretty much consistently. We're getting a lot of blinks, a lot of rapid blinking, and this usually happens with stress. When we get stressed, the eyes dry out, so, you know, over blinking corrects that. But all of that, all of it pales in comparison to what she says at the end, which to me is one of her biggest slip ups, whether it was on the stand or in this interview, to me, this is huge. She's talking about people who have been in abusive relationships, emotionally, physically, psychologically, and she creates this group of people who have suffered through abuse. Then at the end she says, if you're one of those people who has lived through abuse, you don't have the resources that you and I do. You don't have the resources that say you or I do. She excludes herself from the group of people who have been abused and ties herself to Savannah Guthrie, so you and I, who are not part of that group. That is really not how we speak if we feel like we're part of that demographic that we just created. Let me give you an example to demonstrate how off that sounded to me using a demographic that I'm part of. So let's say mentalists, that's a good example. Let's say you come to my house and you see my library and there's all these books on behavioral psychology and body language and people reading and then a whole other section of like the techniques of mentalism, like the actual trickery behind it. And you ask me like, who, who would read all these books? Why, why do you have all these books? Now imagine my answer to that is when it's your job to get on stage and read people and connect with their thoughts and amaze people into thinking that you can really read their thoughts, you read a lot more books about psychology and mentalism and magic than you and I would. Doesn't that make zero sense? I would say if, if, if I felt part of that demographic, which I am because that's my job, I would say you would read a lot more books than the average person. You would read a lot more books than you might. I would include myself in that demographic because that's what I do. But in this case, she's creating the demographic of abuse victims and then excluding herself from it. I think that this is one of her worst slip ups because why would you say that? Did they all come in and lie in court? I am not here to call any of his witnesses any names. That's just a really quick clip of something that I've been getting a lot, a lot of questions about that she's doing in this interview that we didn't really see before in cross-examination, but is very present here. And it's as she's talking, one corner of her upper lip is up here. And this happens in little bursts throughout. And I want you to pay attention to when this happens. It happens here where she's talking about Johnny Depp's witnesses. It happened earlier when she was talking about the jury. It rarely happens when she's talking about herself. The, the abusive situations sometimes 
rarely when it's about herself. Now, the best research on facial expressions was conducted by Paul Ekman, and he has some incredible books that talk about the universal facial expressions that all humans on the planet will exhibit the same way because it's basically encoded into our DNA. I will leave links in the description to Paul Ekman's books and where you could learn more about these universal facial expressions that allow us to know the emotions that someone is feeling, but of all those universal emotions, there is only one that is not symmetric. Everything else is symmetric. When we smile, it's symmetric. Anger is tension on both sides. Eyebrows go down, all symmetric. One isn't, and it's contempt. When we're feeling contemptuous, it's very close to disgust, but contemptuous is moral superiority. It's close to disgust because it's almost, you feel disgust towards a person or towards a specific situation, and that is exactly what it looks like. It's hard to fake this and talk, it, it's involuntary. It's when that one corner of the upper lip goes up and it causes us to see a more pronounced line on one side of the nose. In disgust, we see it on both sides. In contempt, only one side. And it's almost amazing how we see it when she's talking about other people. It's contempt, it's textbook. Before we look at this next clip, I have a warning for anyone who has lived through abuse uh, whether it's in their own lives or someone that's close to them has lived through abuse, this next clip is gonna make you really angry. I think, that's my assumption. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna leave a timestamp right here on the screen. You're looking at it right now over here. This is after editing, I'm, I'm adding this timestamp. Go to that timestamp, it'll skip this next clip and my analysis of it because I think it's going to really upset anyone who's actually lived through abuse. There's a text message where Johnny promises total global humiliation for you. Do you feel like that came true? I know he promised it. I testified to this. I'm not a a good victim, I get it. I'm not a likable victim, I'm not a perfect victim, but I, when I testified, I asked the jury to just see me as human and hear his own words, which is a promise to do this. It feels as though he has. Okay, so uh, let's, let's start from the beginning of that. When Savannah Guthrie says global humiliation, that hits Amber hard. Uh, I think we see a little bit of what we saw when the verdict was being read, which is, it's not this over-dramatized sadness that we were seeing during cross-examination, but what we see is that flutter as she presses that, we hear a heavy breath, the mic picks it up, and she goes down like this, and it hits her. She doesn't display that sadness. She goes downwards with it. And this very rarely happened to her when she was on the stand, but throughout the verdict, she was always down here. And that's more consistent with real sadness. When we're actually sad, when we're actually vulnerable, we try to hide it. So I think that idea of global humiliation hit her, but she doesn't dignify it. She doesn't say it happened. She in fact dodges the question. She does that a lot. And then she says something that just boils my blood and, and I'm trying to stay objective, I'm trying to stay professional, but she says, I know I'm not a good victim. I'm not a perfect victim. What the hell? is a perfect victim. Now I spent a lot of time practicing therapy and as such I dealt with a lot of victims and I can tell you there are all kinds of victims. There are some that are really strong and you don't see that much emotion. There are some that break down. There is literally all kinds. There are some that laugh when they talk about it. There is no such thing as a perfect victim. And the fact that she thinks that there's such a thing as a perfect victim, the fact that she thinks that there's this sort of perfect victim thing that she's aiming for, that she's striving for, might be the thing that aggravates me the most. I get that I'm not this perfect victim. There's this thing that I'm supposed to be that I'm not. There's not anything you're supposed to be. When you're a victim, there isn't anything that you're supposed to be. The fact that she would say something like that demonstrates to me that she doesn't know what a victim is supposed to be. You don't apologize for the way you're a victim. Did Johnny Depp ever apologize? You know, he might, in moments, you might see an apology in a moment where they break down and they go, I'm sorry about this, but they're not gonna apologize for the type of victim that they are or try to make excuses because they're just representing their truth. They're just saying what it is. Hated that line. Why did you do that? Because the op-ed wasn't about my relationship with Johnny. 
but it alluded to him. It, it was unmistakable. It, you know, what the op-ed was about was, um, you know, me loaning my voice to a bigger cultural conversation that we were having at the time. Earlier I said that we were going to see a big cluster of deception coming from Amber and this is where that cluster is. Now, really quickly, I do always define this for the new viewers. A cluster of deception is many indications of deception that happen at the same time that are different from someone's baseline. So what I mean by indicators of deception is there are certain gestures that raise the likelihood that someone is being deceptive, but no one thing can tell us that someone's lying ever. It just raises our confidence and we have to see them at the same time. So if I say one of these things and you think to yourself like, oh, I do that all the time. Well, if it's isolated, it's meaningless. And if you do it all the time, it's part of your baseline, it's meaningless. So let's talk about what this cluster of deception is. First, right in the beginning, as she's saying that the op-ed wasn't about him, she's smiling. And I think this could be duping the light, which is once again, Paul Ekman, who found that a lot of people, when they lie, we see a subtle smile, sometimes not so subtle. And this is related to the excitement of getting away with a lie, or we even sometimes see it when you're caught in a lie. I don't know for a fact that that's what this is here. It could just be her. She's on TV. She's smiling as she says this. She's talking about her oped. Could be that. Might be duping the light, but that's not where the big cluster is. The big cluster is when she starts answering the question. The first thing we get is something that some analysts pair with non-answer statements. Some analysts pair with hesitancy. I call it fluff. And basically, a really great tip is when you ask a question, Look for how much time it takes them to get to the actual answer. Not time to say things, but to get to the actual answer. And with her, there's a lot of little delaying tactics to get to an actual answer. She says, you know what? The op-ed was about, well, um, you know, so two you knows. Well, you know what and you know. Um, pause. Uh, the op-ed was about, that's a non-answer statement. The op-ed, like, just sort of buying yourself time to actually get to the question as opposed to saying, Here's what the answer is. So within there, we're also getting verbal leaks. Um, uh, uh, that's verbal leaks. She doesn't do it a whole lot. It's a mechanism to buy time. Speech disfluency, where she's kind of stuttering and stumbling a little bit. This is what happens when we're trying to come up with a lie. We're trying to come up with what we're going to say, as opposed to just how easy it is to present the truth. When we're going to deceive, the brain slows down and we often see it in these little hesitations. We see the classic Amber Heard eye flutter there. The eyes are fluttering. Uh, we get a lip compression, a pretty clear one this time where the lips compress like this. Uh, this is, you know, without opinion, trying to hold something in. Next, there's a refusal to deny. She kind of shifts the subject there and doesn't actually deny the fact that it's pretty unmistakable that she was talking about Johnny in this article. And finally, this is subtle, but we have a resume or convincing statement. Usually these are a little bit more obvious, like I would never do something like that. I'm too honest to do something like that. But in this case, she says, I was loaning my voice to a cultural conversation. So resume statements and convincing statements are anything that builds your character, that, that, that sort of makes you, paints you under a positive light. And in this case, she's loaning my voice to a cultural conversation. That's what I was doing here. So it's not as obvious as other resume statements, but it is a resume statement nonetheless. You had promised to donate the $7 million of your divorce settlement to charity. It was revealed at trial that you haven't done so yet. However, they played a tape where you stayed on the air that you have donated it. Do you think that raised questions as to your credibility with the jury? I made a, a pledge and that pledge is made over time by its nature. And when you say I donated, you know that everybody thinks that you've donated it, not that you've pledged it. So for the jurors sitting there, do you think they felt like that was you getting caught in a lie? I, I don't know because so much of the, I feel like so much of the trial was meant to cast aspersions on who I am as a human, my credibility, to call me a liar in, in every way you can. And that more. was the trial. It was a credibility contest. And that I was it. We are now going to take a short entertainment break. This is my Amber Heard magic trick. I have over here a dollar bill, just one US dollar bill. But it says something on one side. It says, pledge. Now watch, if I take that bill, and fold it in half once more, once again over here, snap my fingers, say the magic words, that's right, synonymously. 
Give it one more magic gesture like this, you will notice that it now says, donate. Oh my God, she was right. It's the same word. Okay, in all seriousness, I think this is one of the best things I've ever caught. I'm really excited to share this with you. So first let's talk about Savannah Guthrie. Um, she was waiting for this moment. She wanted to talk about this. She wanted to sort of, you know, pin this out. And uh, we see that when she talks about donated and Amber tries this whole ridiculous, you know, pledge and donate thing. Like at this point, Amber give up. Like, you know, it didn't work. You know, j just fess up, just fess up and say, you know, yeah, I messed up. I misspoke on that interview, but I think she's just too deep now because on the stand, she defended this pledge donate thing. But anyways, when she tries it again, Savannah Guthrie, we see that slow blink again. That sort of, you know, as she goes, you know, you know that to most people, like that's not, like you know what's going on here. So we see that slow blink. And Savannah isn't, like Savannah knows donate and pledge are not the same thing. So she's not having that answer. Now, this is where this gets really, really interesting. Right at the end of this, Amber says, first of all, she, she doesn't answer the question. So we have that non-answer, refusal to deny. So she's sidetracking again, as she often does. But she says something and something happens that to me, I have a great theory. As she thinks about the answer to this question, she goes, you know, I feel like a lot of this trial was about, and then she says the following words, casting dispersions. Now, that's not a very common vocabulary, and it's not really Amber Heard vocabulary, but I know exactly whose vocabulary it is, Ben Chu. When Ben Chu was doing his interviews, just last week, he said that exact sentence more than once. It seemed to cast dispersions on the juror's integrity. It cast dispersions on who I am as a human. Now what's interesting about Amber is when she's saying that, we're seeing that same contempt gesture from earlier, which is much less common when she talks about herself and her opinions, and much more when she's talking about someone else. I would bet a lot of money that Amber watched Ben Chu's interviews, studied what he was talking about. In fact, there are moments in this interview where she does almost for the first time take accountability for her actions because Ben kept saying she never takes accountability but here there's these moments where she goes oh I know I said horrible things I did horrible things now she often takes them back immediately or says something like I didn't recognize myself to mitigate that like that's not me but there was accountability being taken in this interview so I feel like she watched those interviews and here she's thinking about Ben Chu as she says cast dispersions. She's using his words, she's thinking of his strategy, and I think what we're seeing here is a pretty clear sign that she's thinking of Ben Chu in this moment. This is my inner mentalist talking. This is like if I was on stage and I saw something like this, I would totally call it out and people would go, oh my God, he's in my head. On the first day of the trial, you issued a statement and part of the statement said, I still have love for Johnny. Yes. Is that still true? Yes after everything. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love him. I loved him with all my heart. And I tried the best I could to make a deeply broken relationship work. And I couldn't. I have no bad feelings or ill will towards him at all. We're gonna end on a pretty intense one because this one actually had me yelling at my screen. This is, to me, excessively inconsistent from what I've seen in my experience in abuse survivors and the way they talk about their past abuser. Now, I've talked about this a little bit before in her analysis where when she reminisces in their beginning, she had those butterflies and she was smiling and that's very inconsistent. There are cases in which someone can detach what they felt then from what they feel now. So it's possible, but pretty rare. But this, first of all, I love Johnny, then she says, I loved Johnny, but she could say, I love Johnny in the present moment. Very rare to hear. Then at the end, she says, I have no bad feelings or ill will towards him at all. So let me get this straight. The guy who allegedly seriously abused you, and I don't want to go into details, but we know what those details are, who then sued you and won, you have no bad feelings towards him? Come on now. I think it's reasonable that anybody who survived something like that would have bad feelings towards someone who did that and then sued them and won. And also, 
it seemed to me on the stand like you had bad feelings towards him. You often painted him under a very, very unfavorable light. So listen, to me, this seems highly inconsistent with the way an abuse survivor would talk. But in this case, forget what I think. I want to hear from those voices that matter. So very often in the comments, I hear from abuse survivors who share their stories and relate their experiences. And if that's the case, and if you're okay sharing this, if you feel like it helps you to talk about it, please, in the comments, let us know. You don't have to go into details, but you could simply say, you know, you're a survivor of any kind of abuse. And then let us know, let me know, did this feel right to you? Because to me, really not. But you know, maybe there's something I'm not seeing here. Let me know in the comments and I will consistently pin stories so the other subscribers can see it and you can get your story out there and you could share from your experience. Whatever it is you feel you need to say to people, I will consistently be pinning comments to hear from you. And I'm really excited to know because to me, talking about it like this, saying, oh, I, you know, I'm not angry, I don't have any ill will. Really? Because you kind of should. So there it was, that was kind of a crazy one. We had some psychology studies, we had some magic tricks, we had a couple of rants. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments what you thought and please, please do not forget this Sunday at 2 p.m. Eastern time, we are doing the live stream with some very special guests. We're gonna look at more clips from this interview, get some amazing insight. I'm really, really excited. Cannot wait to see you there.